Welcome to the Evergreen Thumb. I'm your host, Erin Landon, a Washington State University Extension Master Gardener since 2015 and a certified permaculture designer and modern homesteader. I'm here to share up-to-date research-based horticulture and environmental stewardship knowledge to help you grow and manage your garden and to share what the WSU Extension Master Gardener program is all about. WSU Extension Master Gardener volunteers are university-trained community educators who have been cultivating plants, people, and communities since 1973. Are you ready to grow? Let's dig into today's episode. Welcome to the Evergreen Thumb, Episode 6. My guest today is Jonica Burkett. Jonica is a Spokane County WSU Extension Master Gardener intern. This means she's gone through the Master Gardener training, but has not yet become a fully certified Master Gardener as she's still doing her training hours. She grew up in the Bellingham Ferndale area and spent 15 years in Alaska in print production. That led her to owning her own business where she did a lot of visual communication and graphic design as well as photography. She is also the Master Gardener who designed the logo for the Evergreen Thumb. She was hired by a local greenhouse in Alaska to start arranging flowers and getting photos for social media, and she started helping out with photography and advertising. The following winter, she got hired at another greenhouse doing a lot of the same thing until she moved back to the lower 48 states. All right, Jonica, welcome to the show. Hi, good to be here. Let's start off with uh, you telling us a little bit about yourself and how you became a Master Gardener. Uh, yeah, um grew up in Western Washington and then went to Alaska and uh, I made a lot of friends there and I learned how to grow an indoor sanity garden because seven months of winter. (laughs) Uh, And long story short, my husband got a job here in Spokane and here we are. And uh, while we were out uh, with his sister, one of her friends came and said, hey, why don't you become a master gardener? (laughs) Because, you know, I'm already talking about this stuff. (laughs) They gave me the info and I just joined in. (laughs) All right. So you're here today to talk to us about growing indoors. Yes. What kind of plants could, besides your typical, you know, spider plant or ficus or whatever, what else do, uh, what do you like to grow indoors? I like growing uh, herbs, especially if they make cooking better. And plus uh, one of the biggest things to, to do when you're growing indoors, you got to prune a lot. So if the plant is too busy, growing leaves and stems, then it's not growing roots as, as quickly. And so then you, you don't have to transplant it as often. And plus the, the Italian dishes are just so delicious and not just Italian. I, I grow a lot of herbs. <laughs> um, they are the most worthwhile though. <laughs> what about growing vegetables indoors? Oh, that's a good one. I, I like, I like doing that. I learned you can grow just about anything indoors. There's so much. There's potatoes, cucumbers, uh, tomatoes, especially your, your normal garden veggies. They, they can be grown indoors. Uh, if you know your environments, you, a lot of the stuff that we grow to eat, they, they come a lot from like, you know, Italy's a good example. <laughs> uh, you got your tomatoes and it grows with your basil, rosemary, thyme. So when you grow them all together in one pot, they kind of give each other a, a growing synergy. So, and plus your tomatoes taste even better and you're, <laughs> you have everything ready for the sauce by the end of it. Great. Yep. What are some of the key things to know about growing vegetables indoors? Know what you want to grow and uh, make sure that whatever you want to grow, they're all going to have similar needs. You have, well, like I said, tomatoes is a good example. Um, they have, Need, they need an actual dark period in order to produce the fruit. You can have a 24-hour light cycle. Like when I was in Alaska, we had 24-hour sunlight. And those tomatoes, they grow and grow and grow, but they wouldn't get very big. You get these, these little, little grape-sized tomatoes, and, or a little bit bigger than grapes sometimes. <laughs> but if you didn't, like, some some places they'd actually cover up the tomato plants, like in a, in a uh, light-proof tent, so that they would actually, like, grow and produce good sized tomatoes. And some people, they, they have the talent of with a lot of different fertilizers um, to use, but usually it, it's, it comes down to your light cycle. Um, 
and uh, it, especially, but if you do something like a, uh, something like a leafy green, like lettuce, lettuce, it loves the light. It needs all the light. You can have a 24 hour light cycle on that and you will have lettuce all winter long. <laughs> so just make sure all the plants that you have have the same needs, know their backgrounds, know what you want to grow in there. And uh, just remember that the bigger space you're going to grow, the more things you have to handle. It's, um, it's a lot of control issues. You have to control the entire environment. You're simulating the outdoors. So you have to make sure like, you know the room that you're growing in. If you have like a big old window that's beautiful, beautiful sunlight, but uh, you got one heck of a draft coming off of that, so everything around that window is going to get a chill. You're going to want to do something to, to shore that up. There's um, there's the plastic you can put around your windows. You can get some uh, insulating curtains that have and some blackout curtains. If you need that dark period um, with doors. Uh, make sure the weather stripping is up to date and make sure it's all functional. Uh, in some cases, uh, if you're not going to use the door very often, you can put a big old blanket up over it. Make sure it covers all the, the cracks around it. And, and that does wonders for keeping the draft away. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of, of tricks you can use to, to keep the environment where you want it. And you got you to gotta know your tools. Everybody needs an, an LED light these days. Those are, they're making indoor gardening so much more accessible. Uh, there was a time when there was fluorescent lights and halogen lights, and those were okay. And those were industry standard for a long time, but they are no longer efficient. They are no longer, they're, they're being phased out all over the place because why pay 80% more for your, for the same type of light? Now you do get a little bit of phosphorus off of fluorescent and halogen lights, uh, just a little bit. And so it, it acts as food for the plants. And for some people, uh, that that's great, but it's not enough of a boon to save on that electric bill. And that's always what you're watching is your electric bill. <laughs> We've had good success with LED lights since I put LEDs on a couple of the house plants. It made a huge oh, yeah. difference in their health. Yeah, it does. Also, a fan helps. Uh, one, my first time trying to garden indoors, I'm like, why does it always start getting a mildew or something? And, um, I actually went to, uh, Hawk Greenhouse in Alaska and she said, put a fan on it because you're growing indoors. The smaller the space, it's not exactly known for circulation. You're, so it's probably suffocating. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. And the next thing you know, I got like the littlest little, uh, office fan that you use personal fan oh it made a huge difference but that's that's the gist of it what about a uh, growing medium yes there's a lot of different options in indoors it, it depends on everything from if you want like a set in forget it set up with, with a traditional soil and and watering system that then that's fine but some people you know you, you, some people want a science experiment. Some people want to try something different. Uh, there's hydroponics, aquaponics. I want to try aeroponics next. I've, I've tried everything else, I've, but I haven't worked with aeroponics yet, and it's it's on my list. <laughs> Depends, but like I said, it, how much time, how much effort, how much money you want to put into it. But uh, hydroponics, that one kind of needs a babysitter. You're, you're, you're working with um, direct chemicals to water. And so because that is a science experiment, you have to watch your pH levels just because just the tiniest extra drop will make your pH levels go too acidic and you'll start getting nutrient burn. Same if you don't put enough. So like I said, you, that one needs a babysitter. Whereas aquaponics, you have a fish element to it where they're sitting there in the, in the tank. So the, the roots are feeding off of the fish fertilizer and the fish are feeding off of nutrients from the roots and it's kind of a symbiotic system that one's more of it's it's easier just to watch as long as you make sure the the fish are alive and okay <laughs> so you do have to feed the fish every once in a while <laughs> so and that does the fish kind of help make the system kind of self-cleaning and self-sustaining yes compared to hydroponics yes it does uh yeah hydroponics you gotta clean that water every once in a while and start sometimes start fresh especially if oh no newton burn Take it all out, dump it. In Alaska, it's like dump it, but not too close to the house, so we're gonna slip all over it. <laughs> How 
how do you recommend preparing or taking care of, of the messiness of gardening indoors? Oh yeah. Your, your floors are going to get dirty, especially when you first, first start. But, and if, especially if you have kids or pets, it, you will have accidents. They happen. It, and uh, if you have a dedicated space to your plants, get one of those uh, painters drop cloths. So, you know, they, they have it to protect the floors for a reason. It translates very well to, to indoor gardening and make sure that, that whatever meeting you go. So if you got like hydroponics or aquaponics and you accidentally spill all the, uh, all the water everywhere, uh, make sure that you're using a, a cloth drop cloth because, because those plastic ones, it can, the water will get trapped underneath and your subfloor, your subfloor might get kind of water damaged and you won't even know it. <laughs> so the, the, those painters drop canvas drop cloths are like the best for everything. In my opinion, and you can put those plastic ones on the table where they're sitting on the, on the, <laughs> underneath the light and growing upwards. <laughs> We're taking a quick break to talk about Master Gardener training. Do you want to learn more about gardening, meet new people, and make a difference in your community? The WSU Extension Master Gardener program may be just right for you. You will gain science-based knowledge to tackle the yard and garden problems that matter to you, your friends and neighbors, and to your community. With WSU Extension's Master Gardener training, you'll learn about soil health, plant identification, pest management, sustainable gardening practice, and so much more. Unlock the secrets of successful gardening and make a positive impact in your community. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to become a certified Washington State University Master Gardener volunteer. Visit mastergardener.wsu.edu forward slash join hyphen us today to learn more about the program and how to apply. So watering indoors What's the best way to make sure that your plants are getting adequate water and not too much water? Yeah, and that's part of that mess area. <laughs> uh, I would have a, a dedicated spot to them, and I I put water in the trays. So they they have I get like these big old trays, and I put the the pots in there. They're well drained pots, and I just put the water in the in the trays. So I have a visual reminder that hey, there's water in there, and if there's no water in there, I, I just stick my finger in the soil and Okay, it definitely needs water. Let the let those roots wick it up. The plant knows what it needs. It takes what it needs. Just and and if you're worried about overwatering, don't uh, don't get a really big tray. Make sure there's like a good two inches around the pot, and uh, and you so that way it's you can't overwater it that way. You can't underwater it either as long as you because it's, it's got that reservoir. It lasts a while. You don't have to do as much. Now if you have multiple plants and I really big tray that that starts to get a little bit more tricky <laughs> those ones they uh if one has a problem they will all have a problem so you have to monitor that one a little bit more closely oh no one of them's got root rot check the others it might just be the one but you'll see like oh or you'll see like one's really badly going and then and then you'll check the one next one it's not as bad Third one over, okay, it's barely touched. We got this in time. And then you separate them into their separate little trays and and you put a fan on them and and do not water them. Let them let them get a little drought stress, just a little. And then and then just water them in the trays. And it also helps with hydration. Or not hydration, but <laughs> humidity. Your plants like humidity. They're they're like us. They they like a shower every once in a while. They like they like to feel the moisture on their skin sometimes. Uh, you don't have to water from the top. Um, sometimes all you need to do, you see the water in the tray is a little bit low, but they're okay. Uh, just take your little spritzer bottle, your little water spritzer bottle, and just put just a little bit, just like morning dew. They like that. <laughs> How do you get your plants to fruit when you don't have pollinators? This is the that's the fun part. You get to you get to take one of those those little uh, uh, dollar store vibrating toothbrushes and go around. Some of them, some of them are you don't even need to do that. You can just tap the little flower and, and pollen comes falling out, and and that's all you really need to do. But you want to be efficient. Make sure that this is going to flower. 
you get one of those little vibrating tubes, and you go play a little bee buzzing each one. I am sure they sell like some kind of expensive toy to do that, but a dollar store toothbrush is really all you need. <laughs> yeah, I've used um like a little paintbrush, like an artist's paintbrush too for that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you want to make sure the pollen gets on the bristles mm-hmm. and then go to the next one. They all get it. So, what about pest management? What kind of be- what kind of pests do you see on indoor plants? The most common I ever saw was um, was spider mites. Uh, to this day, I battle them year in year out. They they're a constant one. They they're they're so tiny, and it is so hard to get uncontaminated mediums like from a big chain hardware store or big supply place because they don't know when they have them. So they don't even know they're selling contaminated dirt. Sometimes the best thing to do is go to somebody who's smaller, who's local and, and make sure that whatever growing medium you use from get it from them because they're most likely to actually inspect their stuff and make sure that it's safe to sell. But if you do end up with these these little buggers, they they don't like soapy water. They don't like being clean. <laughs> and so that spritzy thing that you do for your plants that makes them feel good, put a little bit of Dawn dish soap in there, and they don't like it so much. They they can't stick to it. I think is what it is. And they just they can't crawl all over it. And if you make sure that the bottoms of them are nice and clean, like when they're in a pot, you really want to we used to call it lollipopping where, where you uh, uh, make sure the first few inches above the growing medium is completely clear uh, of anything, no little straggling bits, no, no leaves. So that way, um, so that way the, those bugs don't have anywhere to hide. And on top of that, it, it helps that when you put your fan on it, the, the air can get down into the roots. Those roots need oxygen. They need to breathe. And Again, tight spaces, small small indoor spaces, they, they don't get a lot of circulation. So so there's multiple levels to, to helping that. What other types of insects do you see in, in indoor gardening? There was a time I had, I had ants. Oh, ants are terrible. <laughs> They're the worst ones of all. Uh, and that was, that was when I got here to Spokane. <laughs> I hadn't had to deal with ants before and I was trying all sorts of different things, but diatinaceous earth. um, That one, that one was surprisingly effective. The the tricky part was my cat would roll in the ant hills and then come inside and play with the plants. I don't know why my cat did this, (laughs) but uh, it was, I, I, I had to to go all over the yard and find the ant hills and and get them. Um, but, but mostly it's been spider mites. It's been the big trouble. Um, occasionally you'll get a, the, the fruit fly, the natty fruit flies on there. That one, I just used the, the good old fly sticky tape and, and definitely a fan. Get a bigger fan for that. They, they can't stand a strong breeze. If you have a place for that breeze to blow them right into that sticky trap, well, that's easy. <laughs> Is there anything else that you'd like to add? About vegetable gardening or indoor gardening? Ah, plenty. I mean, I could talk all day about it. <laughs> uh, the most expensive thing you're going to buy for it, though, is going to be your LED light. Now, we're in Washington, so, like, there's actual daylight during the days. <laughs> you, you, you don't have a, a three-month period where you're going to have, like, three hours of this twilight wannabe sunshine, and it just be dark the rest of the time for months at just months um so i i ended up spending like 120 bucks on my first led light just and i noticed a significant improvement in my mood in in just everything because because well we're, we're connected to nature we need light too <laughs> so growing things indoors and and having just having like a, a literal nearby nature in your house can be amazingly good for mental mental health and mental awareness. It, it gives you something to do every day. That it, it gives you uh, uh, that light. I don't know what it is about that light, but just it made a huge difference. And those plants love it too. And then plus, you're 
spouse and neighbors love it when you cook because you're using all fresh veg- uh, vegetables and herbs all the time. <laughs> Thanksgiving is a thing at my house. <laughs> we do everything's fresh. <laughs> so when we had a Thanksgiving or Friendsgiving, we would, hey, let's see what's in. What can we use? <laughs> uh, that was the greatest. But down here, you guys have actual sunlight. So you don't need to spend 120 bucks on a light. You can get one of those $20 little LED lights on Amazon and be just fine. I know that the, the electric bills down here are nothing compared to Alaska's electric bills. Those 80% fuel surcharges they'd add to your bill in the winter. Uh, you can't need an LED light. <laughs> Do you have any more information about the um, mental health or emotional uh, benefits of gardening? Well, I have mostly my own experience, but I also have a, a lot of friends up in Alaska that, that they swear by it. They Everybody gets like a little LED light of some kind, uh, a happy light. They call them happy lights and everything. It's just, it's very good to have. And it's hard to explain how, how much it improves your mood. It makes you a little less dependent on other factors. So like... If it's too cold, like if it's 50 below outside, uh, and like if that's too cold to even play winter sports. <laughs> so what are you going to do? You're going to go inside and you're going to stand in front of that really nice warm light <laughs> and you're going to, and you're going to do some pruning. It also like, it also is kind of a, another heater for your house too. It's an extra heater because those things, even though they're LED, they run colder than most. That whatever room you put it in, it'll get a couple degrees warmer. It's a little bit extra. (laughs) I was happy that I had good friends to help me figure a lot of this out. I was happy for the people who gave me the opportunities to learn all about how to grow indoors. It, It was it was helped me in many ways, especially in those those deep dark winter months. I looked forward to to the growing seasons and. And you could grow all year. Um, so you do want to have that little lapse between Christmas and mid-February before you start your summer seeds. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us today and sharing. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Letting me talk talk everybody's ear off about my favorite subject. <laughs> all right. And we'll have uh, all links in the show notes. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Evergreen Thumb brought to you by the WSU Extension Master Gardener Program volunteers and sponsored by the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. We hope that today's discussion has inspired and equipped you with valuable insights to nurture your garden. The Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State is a nonprofit organization whose primary purpose is to provide unifying support and advocacy for WSU Extension Master Gardener programs throughout Washington State. To support the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State, visit www.mastergardenerfoundation.org forward slash donate. Whether you're an experienced Master Gardener or just starting out, the WSU Extension Master Gardener Program is here to support you every step of the way. WSU Extension Master Gardeners empower and sustain diverse communities with relevant, unbiased, research-based horticulture education. Reach out to your local WSU Extension office to connect with master gardeners and tap into a wealth of resources that can help you achieve gardening success. To learn more about the program or how to become a master gardener, visit mastergardener.wsu.edu forward slash get hyphen involved. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to stay connected with us, be sure to subscribe to future episodes filled with expert tips, fascinating stories, and practical advice. Don't forget to leave a review and share it with fellow gardeners to spread the joy of gardening. Questions or comments to be addressed in future episodes can be sent to hello at theevergreenthumb.org. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed by guests of this podcast are their own and do not imply endorsement by Washington State University or the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. Mm-hmm.